today is an anglophone. I don't know where he's hiding. Somewhere. Oh, he's right there. All right, good. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Catherine Rintoul. Way! Okay, so the theme today is climate uh, all over the world. And I'm going to talk about climate and innovation. But in actually a, a, not a modern sense of innovation, but actually a really old, old innovation. And we're going to talk about the Holocene. It's not just a good song. It's actually a period of human history. And it's the one that we're in right now. So it started, bear with me here, we're going somewhere, 12,000 years ago, when all over the world, more or less simultaneously, we as a species all invented agriculture. Now, we were eating the same things before that. But we started farming in five different places all over the world in one single span of less than a thousand years. So that begs the question, why? I mean, if we were all part of this single revolution that swept all over the world, what tipped it off? What made us as a species stop hunting and gathering and living long and happy lives and start farming and getting sick and having a lot more issues just generally as a species to survive? Well, that transition had a lot to do with climate. It had to do with a cold snap. And we, as a species, we follow the same rules as all of the other ones, even if we don't like to admit it to ourselves because we're more clever beasts than the rest. The thing that we did is when this cold snap happened, every place on Earth that we lived that wasn't super fertile became totally inhospitable. And by necessity, the places between those fertile valleys that you hear about when you think about the birth of agriculture, all those places that were pretty good for human living, but not like the most delicious and easy, those places became barren. And we retreated as a species into all of these little pockets of the world. And we started cramming everyone together into these spaces through immigration. And what that caused is, not necessarily, some creativity. It caused us as a species to try to figure out ways to grow food faster and better and more efficiently. And of course, that's what led us to agriculture. It was climate. It was a change in the way that we fundamentally operate as a species. Now, unsurprisingly, we figured it out. We started growing our own food, saving those seeds, and transforming the world around us. We were the first species on Earth to take someone else's genetics, another species' genetics, and use that to our sustained advantage. And that is inexplicable is totally in every single possible way tied in to the climate that we live in. Now, the second part of this story has to do with what happened after that cold snap, when we went back into a period of calm. Because we had developed agriculture in all these different places in the world, and we took it with us when we left those places, and we made incredible inroads into the rest of the planet. Things started to warm up in those ecosystems that before they couldn't hold us as a species anymore, they became very fertile again. And as we started to move and spread our species back across the world after this cold snap, what happened is the good times started rolling, but we didn't just abandon agriculture because it was a pretty amazing innovation for us as a species. It allowed us to survive this insane cold snap, this huge climactic change with incredible ease and success. And we were thinking to ourselves all the time, well, we're not just going to give this thing up. I mean, it might be a lot easier to feed ourselves now, but we're not just going to say, hey, that was a fun experiment, but no, you know what? Farming's not for us. We loved it. <laughs> we thought this was the best thing that had ever happened to us as a species. And it led us more or less directly to civilization. Again, not just a great game, but I would say that the saving of seeds is responsible for the MacBook Airs that you all own pretty much directly. So what happened? when we as a species started spreading back out. Well, we brought the food that we had from those fertile valleys with us, 
and we spread it all over the world. We brought those seeds and we planted them everywhere. And what's cool about this is that we actually have good science on this. Because every single time we cooked that food, we left a little bit of mash in a pot, we left bones of animals around with us, and we understood what we ate. So the archaeological evidence of these seeds moving around the world is crystal clear. But a funny thing happens. As we start to expand as a species, we actually start eating less and less diversely. Now, this seems a non-evident conclusion, but what happens is we keep the seeds that are most productive, right? We want something that grows easily, that produces a lot of food, and it does it in a consistent way. So as we started to expand all over the world, we were looking for stability and predictability. That's what we invented. That was the greatest innovation in agriculture. And it happened over and over and over again through human history that as we as a species start to expand the numbers that we have and grow over the world, very naturally the diversity of what we eat starts to go down because we pick the best things and we take them with us on the adventure. Now, that's caused us some problems. We talk about this in the Bible. We talk about this over and over in human history. Because every once in a while, that decision to go with stability and predictability in what we call monoculture, growing something over and over again in a very persistent pattern, ends up ending in disaster. Because when the climate changes again, just like that first moment, that first cold snap, we have a lot of trouble keeping the vitality of our ecosystems going. When you're betting on a single thing, it can cause massive, massive, massive problems in a society. And that's what happened in the Incan civilization, what happens in mid-century Europe, it happened in the Irish potato famine. I mean, we named a famine after a potato for a very good reason. We were eating one thing, one thing only. And the reason why is because our population was expanding, it was a calm and easy moment in climate, and we became reliant on a single, single species to sustain us. So I'm telling you all of this not because I think it's cool to talk about stories from history and climate, but because it has a very, very uh, indirect connection to what's happening right now in climate and agriculture. If we believe that the diversity of the things that we eat is tied to the seeds that we as a species carry, and we believe that as our population expands, the diversity of what we eat starts to go down as we start to make the best bets and keep them around. The logical conclusion is how we grow food today at scale that is unprecedented in human history. And the population boom that's happened in the last little while has raised the stakes for everybody involved. Now, we designed our food system today in a period of unprecedented climactic calm. We chose to understand the ways that we could grow food in a time where we had 50 years of beautiful summers and mild winters virtually across the globe. Now, there were moments in there that we had drought and famine and all the other things that happened on a small level, but we made the system that feeds us all in a time of incredible stability. And just like during the famines and the cold snaps and the changes through history, I think we all agree that we're entering into a period of instability. Now, I don't know if it's caused by SUVs or Martians or whatever, and I don't really care in the purposes of a 20-minute talk to give you an idea of why climate change is happening. But I think we can all indisputably agree that it's happening. And the systems that we built to feed ourselves are very much reliant on that stability. So the question I have to ask you is, how can we defeat this rule that has governed human history? That when our population goes up and things get fertile, the diversity of what we eat and how we feed ourselves goes down. How can we get around this rule so that the next period of instability is gonna be one that's successful for our species? Well, right now, we're not doing a terribly good job. Because between 1903 and 1983, we lost about, well, 20x the diversity that was in our ecosystems. 
Today, we have far, far less cultivated varieties of all the things that we eat every day than we did even 100 years ago. We are literally driving ourselves to a point of single crop instability. 94% of the seeds that our great grandfather and grandmothers had are gone. The genetic diversity of what we spent thousands of years as a human race building up is starting to disappear at a rate we've never seen before. And today, four crops feed 57% of the food calories of our planet. Think about that for a minute. Four of them feed more than half of the people on this planet. And we know already that climate change is starting to affect this. We've made some really good bets in agriculture, some really amazing decisions to grow better food faster, more efficiently. But climate change is impacting that right now. And just like any other period in human history, we're going to turn back to nature and diversity and try to figure a way out of this mess. So this is very pertinent to everybody here today because the cool thing about this problem is we all kind of have a secret weapon against it. I mean, if you believe that our ecosystems are reliant on diversity to help us through a period of instability, then all of us actually have a way of preventing this from happening. And it's because the most amazing food that we have on our planet, the most delicious food, is actually that diverse piece that we cultivated. We spent thousands of years as a species growing all over the planet in incredible diversity to create something that's really special. That seed history that we share as a planet between any culture that practices agriculture is incredibly important for our future. Not because we think it's tasty, that's just a side effect. It's because as we enter into this period of climactic instability, those seeds, those genetics that are kept from our great, great, great grandfather and grandmother just might be the thing that we're going to need to feed our kids in the future. So that diversity and that ability for us to survive a shock through the things that we have in our history is the key to what I believe is the success of us in the next century as farmers. Even if you are not growing food, we are indisputably all at a certain point related into agriculture. So it's not all the farms, really. It's all the seeds. And the question that I have to you is, well, in what way can you incrementally change the diversity of what you eat? How can you challenge the assumptions that you have around what's delicious food to say, well, I'm going to go and support in some small way the genetic diversity of our planet? Because most of that, by the way, is also what we think is really delicious, and it's become almost trendy. I mean, seven kinds of kale at a farmer's market is a good thing for almost all of us. <laughs> 2,000 kinds of tomatoes coming out of Italy is a good thing for all of us. The diversity of our ecosystems is tasty. And that is one of the only ways we've ever figured out as a species to overcome that problem, to overcome the issue of us just stopping to plant diversity in a period where our climate is really calm and we can take off. So how do we get there? Well, it's pretty simple. Um, I have the really good fortune of working on these problems for my job. Uh, I run a startup here in Montreal that is entirely devoted to the ideas that we have around diversity in agriculture. And no matter what you do for a living, part of your diet is related to this problem. And part of the solution is related to climate. So whether we're, from my perspective, throwing an event for the people that we think are really important in the food system, like chefs and farmers and growers, or we're just spending some time trying to understand how to increase that diversity, it's the support of people that call that out, that demand that their food is more diverse and more delicious than that 57% that comes from four things. That's the fundamental that will help us overcome the next period of climactic change. And like I said, it's really, really tasty. It's the most amazing thing that we've invented as a species, I think, is this incredible 
lot of diversity. And we're not the only people working on this problem. We're building crazy things right now to address these issues, like this massive vault in Svalbard, which is entirely devoted to saving the genetic diversity of our seeds. Because these things, these projects, are really important just to keep us going through this next period of change, to keep that genetic diversity alive so we can understand where and when it will be useful in our future. But I think that pleasure, way more than necessity, will drive diversity back into agriculture. I think it's our tongues and not our brains that are going to save that seed diversity and move it into the 21st century. Because if my great-great-great-grandchildren are going to be planting those things in the fertile soils of Antarctica one day, I want to make sure that that soil and those seeds are going to match. So, demand diversity and get eating. And please, if you think about these problems in agriculture, if you think about these problems in climate, remember that there's a connection between diversity and seeds, and the way that we operate as a species, and there's a way out through really demanding that each and every one of us eat in a diverse and delicious way. That's important for us and for future generations because we can save the planet by eating delicious food, which is kind of a cool way to think about climate. I think we're very lucky that cooking is trending again and everybody's experimenting in the kitchen, but it seems that grocery stores are not following this suit in terms of quality of produce and diversity. So how can we either push them in that direction or and maybe another alternative, how can we get diversity in, into our kitchen from local producers? Um, that's a great question. Um, the, did everyone hear it, by the way? Yeah? Okay. Um, the question was, how can you eat in a more diverse way very practically? Like, does that exist at the grocery store? Uh, sometimes we don't believe that those things are possible, right? To change what's stocked on the shelf of a grocery store, because it seems like this thing that's so monolithic from your childhood, you know? to push that cart when you're like four years old and nothing's changed. The truth is, is that the people that run those stores are terrified of what's going on in food systems right now, right? They need to figure it out because all of us are starting to wake up to these things and we're starting to demand really different stuff that they just don't have. And part of that question around genetic diversity has to do with the fact that we designed a lot of these foods to be kept a really long time in the grocery store, right? And that's changing. But I think there's some really interesting models that are coming out right now. Um, I think that there's some incredible businesses here in Montreal that are going to help change that. Um, so I think that my answer would be try new things. Try just not grocery stores, right? <laughs> try that. See how that goes. <laughs> um, try some awesome farmer's markets here in Montreal. Uh, but also just be on the lookout for the connections you can make directly with, with anyone that you know it could be a farmer. Those people, those hobbyists, so to speak, the people that are not growing a thousand acres of one thing, but instead 10 acres of a thousand things, those are the guys that your kids will thank you for buying from. Uh, a lot of creatives here, a lot of people in startups. I'd like to know how you got your idea for your business and like, why do you, why do you give your life to it? Um, I spent a lot of time in the country when I was a kid. Uh, and I actually worked during the time that I was in school as a chef here in Montreal. Um, and I was exposed to the kind of food and the flavors that were available to us. And I became just totally obsessed. It was like I remember really distinctly the first time that I ever bit into like a really good XYZ, everything on earth. I remember that first moment really clearly. And it became just an overwhelming obsession of mine. So it wasn't like a, oh, I should get into food because it's a hot and trendy thing in startups. No, it was more like, I will not be able to get out of bed in the morning if this is not what I am doing with myself. So I guess sloth is the answer to your question. 